The black belt had felt so far away, I did not want it until I had absolutely earned it. Hello. Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 704. My guest today is Mr. Jeff Nosanov. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I founded Whistlekick and I host this show because I love traditional martial arts. It's really as simple as that. You want to see all the things that we do because we all, because it's more than just me, love traditional martial arts? Well, go to whistlekick.com. It's the place to learn about all of our products and our projects. And if you want to check out the products and maybe pick one up, don't forget to use the code PODCAST15. That'll get you 15% off and help us connect on the back end that this show is supported financially by those of you who love it. Everything for the show, it's on a separate website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new episodes each and every week. And the goal at Whistlekick and of the show and all the, the efforts, well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain you, the traditional martial artist of the world. You want to support that work? You got lots of ways you can help. Like I said earlier, you could make a purchase, but you could also follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick, or you might consider joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash Whistlekick. That's where you're going to go for that. You can jump in for as little as $2 a month. At $2 a month, we're going to tell you who's coming up next for guests. We're also going to give you lots of behind the scenes stuff. At $5, you're getting bonus episodes that we don't release elsewhere. At $10, we're doing bonus video, sometimes video episodes. Sometimes it's exclusive video, but it's stuff you're not going to find off Patreon. I promise you that. And it goes all the way up. And at the top tiers, we've got a school owner's mastermind that you can get on. on. You can support Whistlekick and write it off as a business expense. How cool is that? If you want the full list, all the ways that you can help us, go to whistlekick.com slash family. Today's episode is with someone that is just open and honest and has great perspective and tells a story that likely resonates for many of you. It certainly did for me. The idea of, well, you know what? I'm not going to ruin it. I'm not going to ruin it. I, I'm, I'm tempted to. I look at these intros and I feel like I, I've got I've to talk for a certain amount of time, but I'm not going to. I, I guess I just did. But instead, I'm just going to say, you know what? Stick around. You'll like it. Promise. I'll see you at the bottom. The outro. I call it the bottom. Anyway. <laughs> Hey, Jeff, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Great to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, you know, we, we kind of in the pre-show, we hinted at a couple things. You know, I know a tiny bit about your story. And it's, it's one that we, th this element that I know, because everybody's story is pretty broad, right? Um, there are some elements in there that we've heard before, but I, I've got a feeling that like every guest we bring on, and, and where are you? You're 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 over the 700 mark. We've done a few of these. Okay, uh, it's it's going to be different because it's always different, and that's my favorite thing about the show. So thanks for coming. Yeah, on. thank you. My pleasure. When did you start training? Well, um, I started training. Uh, about two weeks after The Matrix came out in 19. Audience, I want you to know that that question elicited a bigger smile than <laughs> it almost ever has received. I really? Mean, that, was just, that was just like a Cheshire cat grin at that question. Yeah. Um, when I think back to what really got me out of thinking about training and actually into a dojo, it was The, the Matrix. And mm. um, I, was, uh, I was 17 or 16. And maybe it wasn't 99. I can't remember. Anyway, um, I, I saw The Matrix. And like many people, I would imagine many teenagers especially, when he gets plugged into the computer and mm. stands up and knows Kung Fu, um, I'm not sure why that was such a powerful moment. It, it certainly, I, I, was, I was a teenager, but I was intelligent enough to realize it's not how it works. But <laughs> for some reason, I guess, I guess with, with, the, with the benefit of hindsight, I can see that that was a moment of empowerment for the character. And I think I needed, mm -hmm. I, I was ready for that kind of empowerment in my own life. And I happened to have, I happened to have taken the, I happened to get home from high school taking the bus, San Monica Boulevard in LA. Uh, and every day I go past this Taekwondo school. 
Mm-hmm. And um, there was a bus stop right in front of the Taekwondo school. And one day I just, instead of going straight home, I got off the bus and I walked into the Taekwondo school. And uh, I was about 350 pounds at the time. Huh. And I uh, saw, I happened to, it happened to be a black belt class. So I saw some, some moderately athletic and kind of acrobatic stuff, you know, the, the spinning yeah. kicks and, and uh, the, the fun stuff. And I thought, man, I'd sure like to be able to do that. And um, so I said, can I try a class sometime? And they looked at me and said, sure. And uh, I guess it was the next day or maybe it was that evening I went back. And, and that was it. That was the beginning. Wow. Um, that was extremely difficult because it was really, I, I was in very poor shape and had no flexibility. Um, but it was empowering. And, and I think in retrospect, it was the first thing I did as a teenager slash a very young adult or getting closer to being a young adult. The first thing I did for myself on my own without being pushed into it or, or encouraged by my parents. And, yeah. and uh, so for that, it, it sort of still has that deep personal meaning that it was my thing. And that was the and thing that I, struck me when you, you talk about getting off the bus there, you know, it, yeah. Um, you know, you know for, forgive me for making an assumption, mm. but the 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 sense that I'm getting is that you weren't a terribly confident kid. I mean, most most no, of us no. as teenagers don't have a, tr- a lot of confidence. Once in a while, you, you meet someone who does, but that's not the norm. And then, you know, you're drawing some connections between where you were at and where you wanted to be and the the, the gap between. And of course, you end up stepping to that taekwondo school when there's a black belt class when theoretically mm-hmm. the the group that is farthest away from where you are showing up in that moment and that right. wasn't enough to scare you off and that's the part that's blowing my mind right now is all of those steps that seem almost preordained well it it was scary but i i certainly i guess i had the sort of wherewithal to not like compare myself to them but it did seem infinitely far away i mean that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that that's true of any fitness journey that's inspired by something you see outside yourself, you know, whether it's weightlifting or sports or just general mobility, weight loss, you know, um, it, the goal seems infinitely far away. I may, maybe that's like by definition, if it wasn't infinitely far away, it wouldn't be the goal, mm. you know, although there's, there's, some some fitness YouTubers. There's one I really like who says, "Aim for halfway to your goal," and um, I think that's a really interesting advice to give people starting out because it's a little more achievable. But but eventually, at least for me, I I, I learned that there there is no reaching the goal. It's it's life, you know. Yeah. The goal is to not die of something preventable. <laughs> it's a great the point. The goal is to take care of yourself as long as you live. I mean, I so. But that's that's me at 39 and, uh, you know, having thought about it for a while. But of course, at the beginning, it was just like, wow, that's cool. I want to be able to do that. Can, can you talk about those early experiences? You know, I, 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 yeah. I, I don't I don't want to be insensitive, but you you called out your own weight. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and I. I I have not had that experience. I have taught mm. people mm. with, you know, who have been overweight. Yeah. And and I've watched them, let's let's face it, struggle, struggle mm-hmm. to do the same oh, things yeah. that someone who weighs yeah. less would do. And so martial arts is already something that people struggle to continue with, right? They get mm. there and they have these visions of plugging into the matrix and it going yeah. really well. And that's not yeah. the reality. Yeah. And you had an additional um, factor not in your sure. favor, at least physically. Right. Yeah. And and I appreciate being sensitive to the topic, but I'm, I'm open about it. Happy to talk about it, the whole journey. Um, it certainly, I mean, it certainly made it more difficult, but, but, uh, you know, I didn't, the thing about starting a weight loss journey in addition to any kind of concern is like, you don't know, you don't, you don't know. It, it's your journey. It's the only journey you've got, you know? So like in retrospect, and of course, also like on your first day, you don't start doing jumping, spinning, back kicks and stuff. Hopefully you know, not. like you're like, 
you're like standing. I mean, even standing in a horse stance, which, you know, if you do it right, is always, is always strenuous. Mm. Um, but that was like, I, I, for some reason, I remember that being harder than the kicks and the, and the punches and push ups and stuff. Cause it was just like, you just, until you've done that in your life, you just, you, you, you're not used to putting your body in that position, you know, no matter what your starting fitness level is. Yeah. And of course, that's the point. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, it, it was really hard. And, but, but it was really rewarding. I mean, I, I was the guy who was like, you know, when, you're, when your uniform changes color because you've sweated so much, mm. like it starts out as white. And I don't mean to be gross. So, like, it starts out as white, but you sweated so much within 10 minutes that it's like gray. Yeah. That was me um, yeah, for years, really. And um, until I lost the weight, like I, I was the disgustingly sweaty guy. And, but, but for some reason, um, and I was like washing the uniform between every single class. Like mm -hmm. eventually I had like five uniforms for five days a week. Um, but I, at the time, I was not particularly aware of my own emotional state. And so I, I was kind of like looking back at a movie I used to see when I think about how I must have been feeling. Like um, I must have found it. It was really rewarding, even though it was extremely hard. And I couldn't see the, the I couldn't see the progress. You know, when I think about the belt system, especially as it's done in Taekwondo um, schools in America, which is, you know, kind of stereotypically not an entirely merit based, you know, we can go into that. Um, but having those belts to aim for, like for my, my yellow belt, I remember this distinctly. I had to go to a different location in LA and I had just started driving and it was I wouldn't say it was like intimidating to have to drive to like downtown LA, but it was different. And I got there like two hours early. Mm -hmm. They weren't even open yet. And, and like, for me, it was a really, really big deal to be taking the yellow belt test. And, and uh, I guess I was, as, it, as so many teenagers are, I, I was, I was really, I really needed that external validation, you know? And, you know, I, I can certainly see now. And, and, and as a parent whose kids have done, karate for you know a few years before COVID at least like the yellow belt test is, is like I don't say this to minimize anyone's partic anyone's ever but it's like the minimum it's basically you're trying you know right. in, you're, in you're, a lot of schools that's absolutely yeah, true yeah and, and that's okay uh, I, and you know it, particularly for adults it takes a very long time for your body for your arms and legs and hips and things to, to really start moving in the way that you ultimately want them to. Um, and nobody has that a yellow belt, but for me, it was, it was continuing this thing. I started on my own under my own sort of motivation and getting the extra validation, uh, from this new world. Um, and I remember that belt test almost more than any other one. Uh, and I took a lot of them because I, I, I stopped and started as I moved around the country and I went to a lot of different schools. And um, so I probably took twice as many belt tests as the average person who did get up to first degree uh, because I, I'd go somewhere new and I'd be like, well, this is what I was at my old place. Where do you think I should start? Because from the beginning, I knew that the black belts have felt so far away. I did not want it until I had absolutely earned it. I saw people get promoted to it just for showing up. And I was just like, I don't want it like that, you know? And um, I think that comes from, I guess, self-judgment when I started, because I really had very low self-confidence and was very critical of myself. Uh, so we'll get to that part of the story. And the story gets, gets pretty crazy, uh, if I may say so myself. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. But, but um, I forgot the question I'm answering. But that's okay. And that, that's but, the beauty yeah, of the format the, is the question is yeah, irrelevant. Yeah, but but thinking back to that yellow belt test, that was a big deal. A really, yeah. How did you feel on the other side of that yellow belt test then? Oh, I was sure I failed, which is hilarious. Really? You know, nobody okay. fails a yellow belt test. Um, but uh, I, I guess that's how self-critical I was at that point, you know. And I guess I, I guess because it was the first thing I ever did that I chose, that I wasn't being told to read this for school. I wasn't, I chose to enter that myself, that I, I had a very high standards for myself. 
um, maybe even by default, because it was the first time I had put myself in that situation instead of being in school and having a test or, you know, what have you, where it's someone else's structure, you know, that I was yeah. put into by third parties. I could have walked away at any time. But, and so that made me, um, I don't know, it gave me very high expectations of myself, fairly or otherwise, probably unfairly, really. What were the people around you saying about your involvement in martial arts, friends, family? Sure. Um, I think that, well, I, so they were all really supportive. I think everyone knew I had a weight problem. So people were really supportive of me trying to do something physical. Um, and, you know, friends would come and, and watch the class. So I got a few people to try it also. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so people were supportive, but it wasn't really something anyone I knew before I entered that world had any experience with. So people were, but people were great. People were really supportive. Nice. Uh, my my family were like obviously had no idea what what uh, you know didn't know anything about it. But if I would say, look, I'm going through I'm going through uniforms like uh, I don't know, like I don't even have a metaphor. I'm like, can I get twenty bucks for uniform? My parents say, yeah, sure. Um, and if I said, look, I'm, go I'll, I'm going to, to Taekwondo after school, I'll be home, you know, whenever, like, yeah, well, fine, whatever. So, so I had my, my, my mom had enough trust in me that I, that she would pay for it. And, and, uh, you know, I think as a parent now of a nine and eight year old, like, I can't imagine a, a more, I can't imagine a better thing to hear from my, my child, like mm -hmm. my children, than I want to go do martial arts on my own. like what a wonderful thing that would be to hear, you know, because it, sure. it, it does represent those, at least what I think are those values that I want in my children of hard work, commitment and initiative, stuff like that. Okay. I'm with you. Now you mentioned and, and the being... time and the Go time ahead. I horribly sprained my ankle. Uh, I tried to jump that kick way before I was ready. And, and uh, I landed with my, my heel facing up. Oh, and, yeah, that's not yeah. how the foot's and supposed that, to work. No, it doesn't. No. <laughs> um, well, it's like everything is edible. Everything on earth is edible at least once. Right. So luckily, you know, I got the, the foot taken care of and, and it was fine. But, you know, then they did, then they were saying, yeah, just, yeah, of course, go back, but don't do that again. I'm like, yeah, I, I figured that out. <laughs> I'll give it a. So, yeah, everyone was supportive. That's great. Now, you mentioned moving around the country. Yeah, a few times was yes. going to college the the first transition there. Uh, that was the first one, and and this is where the story gets gets really um, gets really. I don't know. I hope it's I hope it's a, a motivational for others. You have because... my attention. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, I, I went to college at UC Irvine, so I was an hour away. And when I got there, I, I checked out the the martial arts programs at the gym at the school, and they were okay, but. Um, wasn't really wasn't really what I was looking for. So I found a, a place in um where was it? It must have been Newport Beach. And I went there for most of college. And that was the first place where I um you know stepped back a few belts. Mm. And that was fine because you know I, I wasn't um, um like I said, I was, I had patience and I really yeah. wanted to, everywhere I went, I saw, I saw people physically functioning at a level I wanted to be at. And I knew I, knew I wasn't there. So I said, fine. You know, was that and, school uh, roughly the same curriculum, the same yeah, style? It was, of Taekwondo? It was basically, yeah, it was basically the same WTF, um, same forms. Huh. And, you know, when I said, when they said, yeah, come and try a class, we'll tell you what belt we think you're at. I said, sure. And that was the first time I learned, well, you're doing the sidekick all wrong, you know, and, and, and when you see a real expert do a sidekick, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, I, I spent many years thinking about kind of the mechanics of, of, of the various Taekwondo kicks. And like, if you think about it, a rat house kick is like a whip, you know, a whip is made of multiple sections and each section accelerates the following section. Uh, ultimately, the, the tip of the whip moving it faster than the speed of sound which is the sound of the crack of a whip. I mean, and, and the human leg is three segments. 
Um, the hip, you could maybe consider a fourth. And uh, so a, a roundhouse kick, for example, is, a, is to me, a, a well-executed roundhouse kick is a really beautiful movement that uses the physics of, of, of each section, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's, you can hit, you know, extremely hard with thousands of pounds of force with, uh, with, uh, with your leg. And I, I spent many years thinking about that. And, and this is be well before I could actually do it, you know, because I was trying to understand like, um, how those, how the black belts were doing it, you know, it was something that seemed impossible for my body to do. And, you know, a, a sidekick is almost like a properly chambered and extended sidekick is, is a very unnatural motion because you kind of coil up like a spring and then you extend. And none of those, none of those, those n- no part of that motion is something you do in your normal everyday life. Um, and so I distinctly remember being shown, this is how you do a psychic. And I tried, and I was like, oh, wow, I, I can't do this at all. You know, you, know you, 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 could, you can imagine like a half-ass sidekick where you don't have the chambering, mm-hmm. you know, and where it kind of starts like a roundhouse kick, but then it extends like a sidekick. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've seen that. Um, and then when you do a, a sidekick and you really try to almost like over-exaggerate the chambering, it feels so, I'm like doing it in my chair. You know, it's like involves the obliques and the hips and you kind of coil up. Um, I just remember that very distinctly. This was like 21 years ago. But I think, wow, there's, there's so much more to this. There is so much more to this than I than I, I saw or thought. And, and that's kind of one of the things I love about it is every step forward you take, at least I saw 10 more steps, 10 more details that, that mm. you know, and and. The theme, I hope, of, of our conversation for me is like that, I, that was so applicable to the rest of life for me that every step forward you take, you see more that you don't know. And, and I, I really believe, in, in, at least in my case, that directly influenced a lot of the choices I've made in my life and the my ways my career went. And even for the multiple, you know, for the multiple, multiple year periods where I didn't throw a single kick, like. I was still applying what I learned in the dojo and in when I had my uniform on. And, and um, uh, that was also when I started having this, this uh, strange physical problem that I've only, that I've only in the last like six months, actually, I think identified, which is I would, I would have this, this, these spasms uh, in my upper back. And uh, I could not get them resolved with chiropractic, with medic, with um, you know medicine, modern medicine, uh, and it, it and it was very, very frustrating for 20 years until very recently, after a, a kind of flexibility and mobility journey I've been on for the last year, that I figured out it was my, I think I figured out it was my pec minor that. I believe because I had terrible scoliosis as a teenager, then did only push-ups for 10 years. <laughs> I really, I really, um, just opening my window. Let me know if there's, if the noise That's fine. is a problem. Uh, it's a long story. We can talk about, well, my flexibility journey is completely different. You know, for years I was the tall guy, so I, I could get away with not being terribly flexible. Mm, yep. I get that. Cause I could bend. You know, I could kick over my head by bending backwards, which is not like the way you want to do it. Um, and nobody really called me out on it because I was still kicking pretty high. Um, you know, I was the guy they demoed everything on because I could take a hit. You know, I was like the big guy. So. How tall are you? Uh, I'm six. Well, at the time I was six three. Now I'm six two for some reason. I haven't figured that out. But uh, and it wasn't my hair. You know, I did have hair at one point. <laughs> Uh, but I definitely was six three, and I'm definitely not anymore. I thought that happened when you're like seventy, but who knows? Um, but uh, anyway, so so that was the first move, and and that school uh, in um, that was my first experience moving Taekwondo school, and uh, I think I found that there's a comfort in going from high school to college, and 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 still having basically the same hobby or the same, uh, 
extracurricular activity, you know, that was separate from college. That was a completely different world. I didn't, I didn't know anyone there that was, that went to college with me. Uh, and, you know, I was exposed to different, to people teaching in a slightly different way. So that was, that was great. It was kind of like, kind of like the, um, kind of like the, uh, almost like traveling enriches your life, you know, studying in different places enriches your life. So, uh, so that was college. And I don't, I don't remember what belt, I think I got up to red belt there. Uh, and then I moved to New York. I, I'm happy to tell the whole story of moving because yeah, it's really, going. I think, one of the most one of the most interesting parts, uh, and not because of me, but just because of the things I saw. So, so then I moved to New York after college um, to be with my then girlfriend, who's now my wife. Uh, and it's a long story. We lived in in a tiny apartment in Union Square for six months. Then we moved to Queens, and I found a, another school in um, another Taekwondo school on Queens Boulevard uh out here and that's where I, I long story i live in new york now again but i lived all over the place in okay Spain. but anyway so go to that school and that was probably my favorite place i've ever trained uh incredibly why? supportive yeah. why um there were two instructors master ray and master sun and they had this wonderful dynamic where one of them was very traditional Korean. His dad was like near the top of the Korean domestic Taekwondo institution. Mm -hmm. um, and Master Ray was uh, just, he, he had that perfect, that, that wonderful mixture sometimes of, I would call it East and West, although that seems so anachronistic to say old and, old school and, and new uh, and new instruction style. Like I found, maybe you found this too. I found that some people, for example, who've never, who's never struggled with flexibility, they cannot teach from, from graph, from zero. They cannot conceive that someone's hips don't move the way that they ultimately need to. Well, you just do this. Right. Exactly. Why, 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 um, why can't you do this? Just, just try yeah. harder. Yeah. Like, like, like a lot of people who've never done push-ups, if they start as an adult, it hurts their elbows, right? And and if you can't do a single push-up, it's hard to get to two or three or ten, mm. you know. And there's ways to get to get to one, like with your knees down or whatever, you know, elevated. Um, and so Master Sun was very much could kick over his head before he could walk, probably. And so he struggled to teach. And I love the guy. And if he ever hears this, this is not a criticism. But I can see now that I had trouble learning from him because, um, because his level of mastery, physical mastery was so high that I couldn't relate to it. Mm. And, and Master Ray, he, uh, he could break things down. Uh, he had infinite patience and he could break things down in a way that I could look up to them, you know, like he could step so far down that at my level, I could, I could see myself getting somewhere, you know, and, and he also put me back to yellow belt again. So that was the second time or the third time. And, I was and, the yellow and belt. What, when, when you came out of LA, you came out of college, yeah. what, what were you ranked? Red. Okay. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. And, and I said, wow. He kicked me down. Was to that yellow. not a, I, a blow to your ego? Not at all, because I had no ego. I had very little self-confidence at the time. And, okay. and I said, look, I, I said, look, I don't. And again, in, the, in these four years, I had seen dozens of people get a black belt for showing up. Hmm. And I knew I didn't want that. I did not want that. I would rather be a yellow belt forever than, than, uh, than, than get that. And, and this was at the same school. There was a guy named David who was in his 50s. And he showed up and he had a uniform on and the uniform looked a little different. And they gave him a new white belt. And you could tell it was a new white belt because, you know, it was like perfectly smooth and all that. But his uniform, it wasn't. And so that caught my eye. And then after the first class, you know, at the end of the class, kind of chatting and like, you know, BSing around. And I noticed his movements were very sharp. That really crisp, you know, like, like snapping. Mm -hmm. you know when the uniform snaps mm -hmm. um, and I said 
I asked, excuse me, have you, have you done this before? And he said, yeah, I was a black belt in Korea in my 20s. And he said, but I've been an accountant for 30 years, so I'm starting over. Mm. And I, I, I remember that guy. I, I don't know what happened to him, but I remember thinking, wow, he had a, he's got a black belt in his closet somewhere. This is clearly his uniform from way back then. So he brought his uniform and got a new white belt. Mm. And, and I thought it was so interesting, and I still remember this, to see the, the muscle memory come back for this guy after who knows how long. Um, not as you know sharp, but, and I can now see it myself, having done a lot of this stuff for 20 years, like if I were to go to a, a dojo now and start kicking the bag, the muscle memory would come back, I'd be sore as hell the next day because I'm out of practice. <laughs> right. but, but somewhere those, the motions are in there somewhere. And I could get, you know, I could start training again. But, but so anyway, I remember this guy, I remember thinking, wow, this guy says he's been, he hasn't done this in 30 years, but he's still got something. And that really struck me because for me, I was very interested in a long-term fitness and health journey. And in retrospect, that really set a great example for me that not only is this guy healthy enough in his fifties or whatever to keep doing this. And now as I'm almost 40, 50s don't seem terribly far away. And it's easy to think, well, of course I can stay healthy in my 50s. But at that time I was 20. So it's like 50 seems a little older. Um, and uh, so anyway, that guy, that guy left a big impression on me. I don't think he ever knew that. Um, um, and there was also a guy there who was a cyclist and a dancer. And one day, and, and he had that that effortless effortless sort of Anderson Silva type movement. Mm, I know what you mean. Uh, that, that, and he also, he got me into cycling, which for a long, before I had kids and could no longer be away from the house for six hours at a time. Um, that was a, a big hobby of mine. I hope to get back into it when my kids are a little older. Uh, but, um, so I met a lot of great people there, but here's where the story, let, let me tell you one, one more example of Master Ray's Please. instructional style. Then I'll get to the really crazy part of the story that really, <laughs> okay. that, that really I'm is, excited. Is, yeah. So at that place, they didn't teach you a, a tornado kick until you were blue belt. And so when I got my blue belt, it was the end of the test. I said, you know, they were like putting the table away and, you know, cleaning up. And I said, so, so Master Ray, can you teach me the blue belt? Uh, the blue belt. Can you teach me the tornado kick? Mm -hmm. Or show me. And he looked at me. And there were still put, the test had literally just ended. I was like, I don't want to wait till Monday. <laughs> and, and he said, of course. So we go in the corner and he start, we start talking about it. While the, and, and that really stood out to me because, because uh, it wasn't about the formality or, the, or the, the, the testing or, you know, I just wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, he didn't say, no, we'll wait till Monday, class on Monday, you know. Um, Without a second thought, I said, yeah, let's do it now. And, um, and, and that, that's all the kind of teacher that I've all, I want to be in, in everything, whatever opportunity I have to teach anything. Um, it's about the, the, you know, if the student is interested and ready, uh, any classroom is anywhere, class time is any time, yeah. you know? And, mm -hmm. and so that really left an impact on me. And of course, that was just the beginning of many years of, falling over while doing a tornado kick. But, but uh, I guess through all of those changes in my life, all that time in my life, it's just having these, these little incremental goals in Taekwondo really, really were valuable for me. Uh, but okay, so here's, so here's where the story gets, gets nuts. So this is the school in, um, in Queens. My, the third, my girlfriend the third school. Then, yeah, the, the third school, yeah. So, my girlfriend then and I, now my wife, we would go almost every day. Oh, she was training and, too. Yeah, uh, she did, came did with you, me. Did once. you convince her to do I that? I got her into it. Yeah, okay, I got nice. her into it. Uh, and I think it was eventually. I, I was going like almost every night, and then eventually I said, "Look, just come with me and check it out." And um, so we were going like almost every night. And one night, Friday night, we get there. We have a normal class, whatever. Saturday morning, we get there something's different. This is like 14 hours later, maybe. Um, all the pictures on the walls are gone. 
uh, all the little knickknacks, like the little um, flower pot, you know, the, 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 the random stuff you don't notice until it's missing out mm-hmm. of the, out of the office and the lobby and like stuff on the walls, it's all gone. And uh, someone is, someone we don't know is in the office taking stuff out of a box. I'm like, Oh, who's that? Where's, where's master Ray and Kim and, and uh, you know, the, 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 the junior instructors and stuff. And they say, Oh, we're, uh, we're the new owners. And I'm like, Oh, who are you? Like, what happened? We were here like 14 hours ago. And, and they said, yeah, they didn't tell you. Um, I'm not going to name the new owners because you'll, you'll see why. But uh, the reason I haven't named any of the school uh, and given you the relatively common names of Ray and Son. Um, and it turns out that overnight, the ownership of the school has been taken over by this this. Taekwondo school group that has like 20 locations. And uh, finally the new instructor shows up and my, my girlfriend and I, and the other students, we, we literally corner him. We say, what, what happens? Where's, where's our, where are our, where are our people? Mm. You know? And he says, I don't know. They just told me to come here and teach today because it was a new location. And what we later heard, was that there was a hostile takeover of sorts where the instructors that we knew and their their owner, you know, the owner of the school was basically like pushed out by this corporate Taekwondo school group and basically taken over for reasons we, we didn't get the, to the bottom of to the point where our master basically, where there nearly was a, there was a nearly a fight in an office between two competing school masters, school owners, like in a Kung Fu movie. Yeah. And we, I didn't believe that at first, but the, 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 the abruptness with which the transition happened and the total lack of transparency to either the new staff, you know, it's not their fault. They were, sure. they thought it was just a new location. Like, sure. um, you know, but when you show up and all the pictures of all the kids you've known for two years are gone, uh-huh. it's like a little bit of warning would have smoothed this off, smoothed this out a bit. Totally. And and they're like, oh yeah, we're we're gonna take over your contract, so you're gonna start paying us now. And it's like, like uh, really, is that what we're gonna do? And we were very protective of the old of the old management. Um, and and uh, we stayed there because we stayed there for a while because. It was still the best location for us. And we wanted to give them a chance. Mm-hmm. But the new place, it was very interesting. The old management encouraged everyone to go to tournaments in the Northeast uh, generally. Mm-hmm. The new management, they only held their own tournaments for their school group, mm-hmm. which I see you grinning, mm-hmm. which I found fairly cult-like. Uh-huh. And... Um, and uh, I remember thinking, oh, so this is now my fourth, the, the fourth management school, the fourth school management I work with in the third physical location. Um, and none of these other people realize there's a world outside of this school group. And that's the way they want it. And that was really disillusioning and frustrating for me. Because for me, Taekwondo was about this new, this new world that I got to explore physically inside myself and, and around the country. Mm -hmm. And, um, it was very constricting. Now my girlfriend, uh, because it was, it was still the only physical place she had done Taekwondo. She, she found, um, she found it more tolerable than me and she stayed there and she eventually started to help, help, uh, help out. And like, she led the stretches for the little kids and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And, but for me, I just really, it really, really didn't like it. And so what I did after a while, I got up to Red Belt again. And I just really didn't like, I just really didn't like it. And I couldn't, I, I just, I couldn't stay there. So here's what I did. So I called my, the old master, Master Ray. And I said. Had, had you talked I, to him prior? A, a little first- bit. Okay. A little bit once when they disappeared, you know, it was clear they were not they were not to go to this location anymore. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I said to him, I really would like to keep studying, keep practicing with you. I don't know if that's possible, but at, at the time I knew I was moving out of New York. This was the end, this was like late 2007. I knew I was leaving New York in June of 2008 mm-hmm. or August of 2008. I said, I want to train with you. Where are you training these days? And it turns out he was training at the boxing gym in Queens, uh, kind of near, not near LaGuardia exactly, but like uh, in Flushing, in Flushing, Mm -hmm. Queens. And so he said, come on by sometime. And so I, at the time I was in school and I had Tuesdays and Thursdays, I had class all day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was in law school. And uh, like 10 hours a day on those three days. And then I had no school Tuesday and Thursday, which was great because I lived in Queens and I had less commuting and all that. But I had all day and Tuesday and Thursday off, basically. So I said, okay, I'll come out on Tuesday. It was an hour bike ride to the gym. And of course I was there, so I wanted to work out as long as I could. And then it was an hour bike ride home. So it was very physically challenging in a good way. And after a couple of times, I said, you know, I'm really enjoying this. I've been training for like nine, eight or nine years now. Uh, I would like to get a black belt from you. If and only if you think I've earned it. And we don't have to talk about it ever again, but I'm moving out. I'm moving in June. If you think I've earned it by then, I'd love to get it from you. And if not, I don't want it. And we never talked about it again. And uh, a few weeks before I left, he said, go to this address. Your black belt is waiting for you. And so I went and picked it up. And that was how, and that was, that was, that's, that's sort of my black belt story. Mm. And um, that means, more, so I don't have a formal cookie one certificate or, you know, the official but uh, after what I've seen, I wouldn't have it any other way. Talk about talk about that training, right? Because I, mm. I think most of us who have been around for a while, we we find instructors that we resonate with, people that really mm. mean something to us. And uh, for a lot of us, we we get the opportunity to remain training with that person mm. or those people for a long time. But more often than not something severs that relationship, yeah, whether yeah. you start, tr- stop training, one, one party moves, whatever. Mm-hmm. But there's something kind of special in what you're talking about in that you were able to see the contrast, the same physical location, mm-hmm. mostly the same people you're training with different management, yeah. different instructors, same more or less curriculum. It sounds like, mm-hmm. but you saw the contrast of him there versus him, not there. Yeah. And coupled with, you knew you were leaving. You had a finite amount of time with this man that you really valued. Mm. What was it like training with him? Because I'm assuming it was one-on-one. It was one-on-one. And, you know, his friends would show up and, and uh, it was a boxing gym. So it was, mm-hmm. there were people boxing and people lifting weights. And uh, it, was, it was great. There was no heat and no hot water. It was like over an auto parts store. Or, or an auto shop rather. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but it was very well equipped. And sometimes we would just, we would just punch the bag. And sometimes we would um, do a, I don't know, 500 hook kicks or something. And sometimes we would lift weights with his friends. And I was young enough that I could, I could lift weights with poor form without injuring myself. <laughs> um, I wouldn't do that now, you know, and now I, I, I if a bunch of guys I know are like lifting heavy, I would either not do it or just lift the normal weights I lift and not try to like keep up with them because I'm 39 years old. But uh, I would basically just follow his lead. And there was actually, there was one time this Greco Roman wrestling guy came and I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but when he showed me the, the underhook hold mm. or whatever, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know what it's a hold. the underhook. I never felt so much physical strength around me in my life. That man could have ripped my arms out of their <laughs> sockets like Chewbacca losing the holographic chest. I was so 
I was so and maybe the nerdiest reference we've ever had on this show, and I love it. I I do my best. Um, like, and this all of this leads up to my career with NASA. Like, this is all directly getting there. Mm. Um, so the space reference is entirely like in character. But so I got all this random exposure. There was the one day I really pushed myself too hard. But there was this capoeira person who showed up. Well, let me finish the story about the wrestler guy. Okay. Uh, it was like a statue was alive. I did not know a human being was capable of, of that. It was so inspirational. And the guy, the guy was like a re- really intense guy, but obviously not going to kill me. I was a, sure. I'd never done it before, but he could have with like his eyebrow, you know, I had never, I had, I knew that the, the ancient Romans wrestled naked in the mud, you know, whatever, but, but, uh, to re- to literally be, to be in a, Experts Gre- Greco wrestling hold was was a mind boggling experience. I was yeah. like, I cannot move. If this guy wants to, I am effing dead. It was incredibly powerful, and I'm so glad I had that experience because I just didn't. It's like it was like 50, it was like ten years earlier when I saw the black belts for the first time on, from the bus stop. Like, wow, I didn't know people that the human body was capable of this. I thought this was a legend. I thought this was myth. But so anyway. Um, that was cool. The, the, the day I pushed it too hard uh, was there was a capoeira person who was there. And so that day we were doing capoeira instead of taekwondo. And uh, if you've ever done capoeira, you know it's like doing squats for like an hour straight. And uh, so at the end of that, I get on my bike and I can't pedal my bike. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I got an hour bike ride. It's like 25 degrees out. I can't move my legs. <laughs> so I sat there for a half an hour and I was able to hobble home. But, but uh, again, wonderful to see that in person, to see that, that beautiful art in person and, and physically experience it. You know? And when, there's nothing quite like when, you, when you're so when you're so directly faced with the limitations of your own body mm. in a safe environment, or at least a safe-ish environment. Um, uh, so that was, that, again, th- those things stand out to me because, uh, I don't know, it's just very, it's just so different than everyday life, you know, when you're going through school and jobs and careers and like, you know, there's a, there's a there's a deeper world, which is the the which one way to explore that is 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 with martial arts. You know, so what's what's coming across to me is, you know, if we were to really simplify this story for you, it's valuing knowledge, it's valuing information that you yeah. you so greatly gravitated towards someone who encouraged branching out and your the yeah. stories. I asked you to talk about that training with him. You, you said a few words about training with him and shifted into talking about the things he exposed you to the other people. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you know, that, that that's, that's not a judgment. I mean, you and I are very alike in this way that to see more and to realize how much more there is and that you're never going to get all of it. And right. then, you know, you, you foreshadowed a bit talking about NASA. I, I'm assuming there's no one at NASA that doesn't value knowledge. I also assume that. Okay, so may, maybe there are, maybe my assumption is wrong. But <laughs> the, the, perhaps yeah. better stated as a, a general yeah. trend that the yes. people involved yes. in yes. this organization. It's hard, yes, it's hard, but not impossible to get a job at NASA without a deep passion for not, for, for learning. And, okay. and um, I see that we're, we're almost at, at 9.50. I, I, I'm going to keep talking to you as long as you'll have me because this yeah, is so much Yeah, keep fun. going, man. Um, and uh, I, 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 I want to hear I, how I, this stuff relates to NASA. Sure, sure. I don't know that I've ever uh, gone through it in this much detail. So it's really cathartic for me to, to tell a story. So, okay. Keep it up. So I'm moving out of New York. I have my crisp black belt. Um, and I, I'm almost afraid to wear it. I'm like, mm-hmm. for me, it's, it's, it means so much more just to have it in my, in my drawer. Or like, it means so much more off of my body in my mind than it would ever mean, you know, around my waist. Um, 
So then my, my, my wife, my girlfriend and I get married and we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I have, um, so I got, I went to law school in New York and, uh, my formal training is actually as a space lawyer, which <laughs> is a, weird. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah, I know. That's what, it, <laughs> I would have assumed yeah. that was post space force, that that yeah. wasn't a job no, until space no. force was the thing. So now, now people have heard of the space law sort of, but at the time it was like, Remember, it was 2008, the economy was collapsing. My choice mm -hmm. was get a job in the most devastated industry of all. Um, Real estate. Well, okay. Well, I was going to say law, but because the law firms were, basically all the entry level law jobs were decimated because sure. the top, the head was cut off and everyone you know, moved up. It was kind of like the Soviet Union collapsing mm. uh, where everyone was, was grasping for whatever was, trying to loot whatever they could find. Um, um, and uh, not leaving a lot of room for entry. But anyway, so, so we moved to Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, where I was going to do the space law program. And uh, so you know, we got settled and, and uh, um, we went looking for a martial arts school. Now, this was where things got really interesting. I mean, maybe this whole thing is interesting. I, I hope so. But... Absolutely. Martial arts in the Midwest was such a different world. Mm. I don't know if you've ever been or ex experienced it, but lacking the, this is going to be somewhat generalized because that's okay. That's all I got, but lacking the, the direct Korean, this is just my observation, mm -hmm. the direct in places where you didn't have first generation Korean immigrants starting school. You have these weird, like American, like you have places where people have American flag geese instead of the simple plain white gi, which I which always represented in an old fashioned way to me to be a form of humility and mm -hmm. like you have these like bright colored, sometimes literally American flag printed uniforms and and you have just you have, what i found is it was much more about fighting than about it was much more about competing with others and then mm. improving yourself if i could summarize it and that's I, i'm sure that's not true everywhere but the few places we went um there was one place we went that that actually wasn't like that we were only there for nine months so we didn't actually sign up anywhere mm -hmm. but we tried a bunch of different places and there was one place that taught uh, the staff that I really liked, but I wasn't going to, it didn't work with my schedule. I had classes yeah. at night, but I had never experienced that on the coast. And, and that sort of hyper nationalistic co-op co-option is not the right word. That super, that kind of hyper nationalistic merge, merging of hyper nationalism with Taekwondo was very strange to me. It, it reminds I, me of the way football culture is in the Midwest. You know, I, I, yeah. didn't, I didn't grow yeah. up there, but, you know, I've had conversations with people. They talk about football being the pastime mm -hmm. at any level. You know, people mm -hmm. coming out in droves to high school and, and junior high football games where, you know, here in the Northeast, that's not a thing that generally yeah. happens. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's as good an analogy as any. But, but combining that with the completely... Combining that with the the I, I don't know how to say it. I, I want to use the word foreign, but that doesn't sound right. You know, you it, go into okay. a martial arts school. You go into martial arts school, and you've got a Korean flag on the wall, right? Quite common if it's you know, yeah, sure. If it's taekwondo, yeah. hapkido, etc. Generally sparse decor. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm going to call that Eastern because I just, I don't have any other word for it. And, and that's, I, I suspect and, far more people are relating to what you're talking about than you yeah, may realize. So just, yeah, just don't, don't yeah. sweat that. I, sure. I, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to paint a picture of what I saw in the hyper American version that to me, so much of, so much of what I valued about Taekwondo was, is, it's a different culture. Hmm. 
And when I walked into a place that tried to apply American culture to it, it was very jarring for me. Mm. And it really w- w- didn't work for me. And I saw them encouraging aggression in children, mm. not conf- well, and confidence, but where, where I had previously seen in four other places, aggression was, was not the point. Confidence and discipline and self-improvement was the point. Those things were still there, but they had a layer of aggression that I really, really did not like. So I didn't really formally train there. I just start weightlifting in Nebraska because there's nothing else to do in the winter. But but uh, <laughs> I didn't train martial arts there. Um, so then we, we moved to L.A. I started working at a NASA center and my wife started medical school. And. We ended up at a wonderful Taekwondo school in Pasadena. Um, and I did a group on, I had a group on for like 20 lessons of capoeira, which, which is really interesting. Nice. Um, not enough to keep up. How were your forever, legs? But uh, I, I started, I started, I, I did it once a week, actually. It took that long to really feel like mm-hmm. I could even work out again. For me, um, when I started capoeira, it was my calves. Yeah. My I couldn't even work. identify the different muscles at, by that, at the end. It was just like one frozen <laughs> block of meat. Um, uh, so, so that that place in LA, the, the Taekwondo school, is where my wife got her black belt while she well she took her black belt test while pregnant with our son. Wow, um, impressive. Yeah, so that was cool. Um, and uh, you know when when he was born. Oh, so, so that was the place I trained actually with a black belt on mm-hmm. and, you know, having showed up there already having a black belt was really interesting experience. And, and, um, I really, I tried to, you know, no matter how I feel, I know, I know what it feels like to walk into a place and look at someone with a black belt on, you know? Mm-hmm. So I tried to use that as a way of being a leader. Or a, or a teacher or or a, an example, you know. I really sure. tried to embody that, and I hope I did. Um, and when our son was born, we really stopped training extensively, uh, and then we moved to DC in 2014 for my wife's residency program, um, and we didn't train there. When and then we we had another baby our daughter in 2014, they started doing karate. My son started when he was three. This was in Bethesda, Maryland. And, um, he, so we, he would, he would do the very, you know, little kid class. And my daughter would sit there and watch. When my daughter turned two, this was great. She walked up to the instructor. She said, I do karate. And, and the instructor said, no, you have to, you can't start till you're three. And she said, I do karate. And that went on for a few weeks before he said, fine, go. (laughs) She said, if he said to her, if you can listen and you can do what the other kids are doing, you can start. So she did. And and it went okay. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And, um, and so they both did it until COVID, um, until COVID hit. And then we moved up here to New York for my wife's fellowship program. And, you know, through, through all of that, all those years, you know, I talk about, I talk about, oh, so let me, let, before I kind of draw this all together, like, so in 2014, I had to leave the NASA center because my wife's residency training program was in DC. So when you finish medical school, you have limited input into where you end up for your next step of training. Mm-hmm. And if you don't go there, you don't, you're done. That's it. You know, so you got to go. So, so that's a very long story itself but basically it was a huge blow to me it it was the i I was very depressed it was very hard for me it was extremely hard um and then i started two companies and then in 2019 the government shut down and ruined them so it was another big setback and then we you know we moved up here and then covid um and but the point of all that is is that I have been used to struggling and failing in martial arts for 20 years. 
And I really believe that that experience of has really helped me. That's what I mean by using martial arts every day, even if I don't kick something. I really believe that 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 gave me the mental resilience to get up and figure out the next step. Like I distinctly remember for years struggling to do a tornado kick. Um, so I used to tear up like the skin on the bottom of my feet used to get really torn up from trying to pivot, you know, on a tornado kick after several years and I couldn't pivot fast enough. And so I wasn't getting the rotation. So I wasn't, you know, it was just very clunky. It looked like a, you know, a, a drunken robot, like trying to do it. And it felt like it too. And then one day I was watching someone doing it and I realized they're not actually maintaining contact with the ground the whole time that they, during that 10th of a second pivot, hmm. they're not actually sliding. They're just barely leaving the ground on that planted foot. Or maybe there's just the contact with the ball of their foot. And then before they do the, the, the jump part, that's when they have just the slightest moment, momentary full contact with the foot that lets them push off. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And then I did it. Then I did a proper tornado kick for the first time. And I don't know why. I, I don't, I honestly don't know why I, I, I don't know where the, 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 the all-consuming desire to get this stuff right came from, but it was there. And I really believe it's transferred over to other parts of my life. You know, I have these random moments of these random memories of like finally figuring something out, like, like the first time I did a hook kick mm -hmm. and I felt, oh, that's how I can see now how other people can chain a hook kick in with other moves and like keep moving. You know, um, so somehow that that experience on the mat really helped me with things outside of my uh, outside of the, of training and and um, you know major life challenges and transitions and stuff like that. Sure. Um, it it makes sense. And it's something that I think a lot of people are, are likely nodding yeah. along with, you know, it's a common experience to, to yeah. perseverance, right? You know, one of the five tenets of Taekwondo. Yeah. And, and on perseverance, you know, throughout all this time, I, I kept having those spasms and I, I really, I still struggle with flexibility during COVID, you know, and I never really, I all, I kept looking for a solution to those things. And I kept trying different stretching programs and, during COVID, I finally bit the bullet and bought something I kept getting Facebook ads for called, uh, I'm going to pit, I'm going to plug them because they really are that valuable to me there. It's, uh, I want to make sure I plug them properly. Sure. Uh, it's the 21 day hip challenge from. Oh yeah. Yoga, yoga bar. Oh, you know them. Okay. I, I've, I've seen that ad come through. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I finally did it. And it is absolutely life-changing. For the first time in my life, I actually started developing more flexibility and, and range, range of motion. And the reason is that th th it has you hold these poses for five minutes straight. Mm -hmm. And what I found after the first couple of weeks of awkwardness and you know soreness the entire previous 20 years of my life, when I was stretching for 30 seconds or even a minute, almost completely useless, it took two minutes, two full minutes before I even started to actually stretch. Mm -hmm. I thought I was stretching all those years. I wasn't. I wasn't actually stretching the muscle. Maybe I was getting the, the connective tissue to relax, mm -hmm. but I wasn't actually stretching the muscle. And I've been doing this, these programs from that, from, from, from yoga body, uh, 21 day stretch and some other stuff for a year. Now, I recently started doing the, uh, he had this, this one session for, for hamstring stuff. And at 39 years old, I am more flexible than I've ever been. That's awesome. And I'm applying to, um, I've been applying that 
to the to the, the, the tech, minor. tech minor stretch. Yeah. I, I have something similar for, on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Holding it for five minutes, which is excruciating. But I'm breathing deeper. I'm feeling mm-hmm. better. I don't have that tension in my back. And I realized after sitting at a computer for 20 years and doing push-ups for the first 10, even though I started lifting weights and, you know, worked out the back also, like, no wonder, like I had never stretched this in my entire life. Yeah. And so I, but I never gave up on, on the stretching and I, I didn't get anywhere for many years, but I kept trying new things. And now I, I do this stuff for like an hour a day while I'm on meetings or like reading or watching TV or something. And it is absolutely life changing. And I think I'll be able to touch my toes with straight legs by the time I'm 40. Oh, that's great. August. Wonderful. Yeah. And, and again, it's, it's that this recurring theme of your willingness to remain open and just, just keep trying, you know, I mean, yeah. you, you're, if I did my math right, your, your black belt was 10 years. Yeah. Something like that. Right. Yeah. Like a lot of people aren't going to handle getting pushed back. Okay. Red belt to yell about, right? Like they're not going to deal well with that, but you kept going. Your priorities were slightly different. It wasn't about rank. It was about wanting to develop and be better. And, and I refer to that as a, a white belt mentality. You know, this idea that there is so much more, infinitely more ahead of you to learn than you've already learned. And if you yeah. focus there, I, I think a lot of good things happen. And, and I just, I'll never forget the moment I got my black belt and I realized, Oh my God, there's so much I don't know. Mm. And uh, yeah, I kind of like, I felt like I didn't know that before, but the first time I put it on, I was like, Oh, I don't deserve this. <laughs> how, how did I get, how did I end up with this? Yeah. I know. That's I thought, well, well, sure. I, I worked really hard for many years, but, but, oh, I left out something that you'll appreciate. So, so this was a few years after I got my black belt in 2010, we went on our, was it our honeymoon? Uh, I don't remember. It was either honeymoon or it was going to, so I went to Southeast Asia twice, once for my honeymoon, visiting my sister-in-law who was living there. And the second time for her wedding in India. Mm-hmm. And um, one of those two times, we were in Thailand for a week at this this uh, I guess it was a resort. And one day, I was like, I'm going to go walk up this mountain and see what's up there. And uh, it was like a tourist. It wasn't like super touristy, but there were like rock climbing groups over here, and you know, people on the beach, and like it was it was beautiful. It was wonderful. Um, but I'm like, I I feel like walking up this mountain. And I get to the top of this mountain like two hours later, and I see this rickety boxing ring. And this guy comes out, and it turns out it's a Muay Thai gym. The top and, of the mountain. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm standing at the top of a mountain. I'm already exhausted, but this is a Muay Thai gym. I don't, this guy doesn't speak any English. And so I kind of go like this, and I'm like, with a smile on my face, I'm trying to convey, can we, like, can you show me something? Like, I'm here. I didn't, you know, he, he wasn't expecting me. I wasn't expecting that. And so, you know, he brings out a pad and we kind of communicate with, with gestures and smiles. And, and, you know, he's got his, his very basic training equipment. I mean, I'm lucky he didn't hit me with a stick, you know, but, but, uh, and like the, the mat or the, the boxing ring is like a real sprained ankle, uh, ankle spraining magnet. Cause there's like boards. on. I remember this distinctly. The boards are not, there's gaps between the boards. And I'm like, I have big feet and my feet are going to get, if I'm not careful, going to get stuck in here mm. and twisted. This guy's feet are much smaller. So I don't know why that stands out. It, it was, it was a rustic. I'll put it that way. It's mm. <laughs> a good word. And yeah. And so we spent about an hour and like, of course I'm thinking this guy is so much more legit than I am. I'm just an American who's trained in a air conditioned gym for, you know, for a while. This guy has probably been doing this on a mountain with, with spikes on his fist. <laughs> Um, and he's got like ropes around his hands, yep. but, but, you know, and so I, I, I say Taekwondo and, and we don't really speak in, we don't speak the same language at all, but he recognized the word Taekwondo. And so I show him some stuff and, and I don't know, he's probably humoring me I, for my own humility. I have to believe he was humoring me because this guy, 
for all I know, it's like a cage fighter in Thailand, right? Mm-hmm. But but I'm thinking, look, I'm never going to have this opportunity again, or at least not like this. And if I do, I'm going to be a lot older, so I got to try it now. So we just kind of go back and forth, and this he shows me he shows me that in in the, so this is I, I'm glad I learned this because I thought in in Muay Thai when you knee somebody, I thought you're moving your knee up. Apparently, you're not. You, your knee remains stationary and you're moving your whole body and you actually strike with the top of your knee. I thought mm-hmm. it was with the bottom. So not that I have any intention of hitting somebody with a Muay Thai knee, but it was cool to, to, to be shown that in Thailand on a mountaintop without in- English. And, and I remember thinking, man, someday I want to have the, I want to go to Japan and do Korea, I mean, do, do uh, karate and a waterfall under a waterfall, you know, these, these kind of, Maybe they're stereotypical in a way, but I want to have these these authentic experiences. You know, the, the only these, stereotypical there, there because a, of movies. Who actually gets right, to do these things? Right, like that's right. awesome. There, there was actually there was a there was a great TV show back in those days where these two guys would actually travel the world and and do these this. I forget what it was called. It was, it was in like the heyday of it was before YouTube, but it was like the heyday of kind of traveling documentary. Hmm time and these two guys would go to like japan and train karate in the mountains and stuff like that and nice. all over the place so i was like i want to do that um but, but anyway so so getting back to today like i haven't done my stretches yet today uh but i'm going to i'm going to get a nanometer closer to to uh touching my toes mm-hmm. and um i haven't trained taekwondo much in the last seven or eight years since my kids were born I guess almost 10 years now, but COVID's opening up. Uh, we're moving again in uh, August. My wife's finally done with her training. And uh, I always wanted to train Taekwondo or karate or something with my kids when they're, when they're getting bigger you know, and they're big enough to be training with them, with me, not just like when they're little kids with a little class, you know, and it's looking like, by the time we get somewhere, can, can get settled and sign up, I will be over 40 years old, but mm-hmm. more flexible than I've ever been. And I'll be ready to hopefully have that special time with them and hopefully teach them a little bit of what it's meant to me. And, and that's, that's sort of my journey today. And I'm so glad I got off that damn bus. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, now, uh, now in, hind- in hindsight, if yeah. you go back, you know, yeah. Obviously, the, the the genesis of the desire being the Matrix and plugging in <laughs> and Neo and all that, you know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure if you. Knew that... ru- if only they hadn't ruined the the first movie with all the crappy sequels, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the fourth one? Yes, it's terrible. Oh, see, I I completely disagree. I think it is really it is almost as good as the first. I think it's it's phenomenal. Well, we may need but, to have we we may need to have another session on that. We might, we might. I, I will <laughs> we'll spend an hour and I'll tell you why you're wrong. I, I I'm serious. <laughs> Let's schedule it. But go go on. <laughs> um, but I'm I'm still struck by this very clear persistent that's the word that keeps coming up for me path that you've walked in your training and as you've woven in and out you know and and right now you're kind of woven out of training but you're still training you're still applying right like it's not you know you're not done and all of that resting on what you presented and, and still sounds like was just short of a whim well, I think that at the time I really, okay. So like if I was looking at a teenager now doing the things I did, I think what I would observe is this person needs something to own mm-hmm. for themselves that they chose as a teenager. I felt like I was getting told what to do. Like everyone does. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, didn't have a lot of choice into what classes I took or like I didn't, I had some really good friends, but like, I really had no confidence with girls. Like I didn't have, I didn't have anything that was mine. I feel like, and I think I, I, I don't think I would call it a whim. It was more like martial arts was exposed to me at the exact right time. Mm -hmm. I needed something for myself. And I think that's where the emotional connection 
came from and continues, even though at the time I couldn't have recognized the emotional component because I was a, you know, teenager. But that, you know, even just going through all of this for the last hour, like that's the through line. And, and I still, you know, when I stretch now or when I work out now, it's like, that's me. That's my time. You know, that's not unique to martial arts. Plenty of people, fitness activities are their time. But, but for me, it connects deeply to the whole, to the whole story. Um, you know, if I, I want to travel more eventually. And some, I, if I ever get the chance to do karate under a waterfall in Japan, I want to be ready physically to do it. You know, yeah. I don't want to have to wonder, am I going to get hurt? I don't want to have to wonder, you know, so to, to say nothing of just generally being healthy and strong and, you know, able to deal with what, what life throws at me. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's this, when you have something inside yourself that, that, you know, no one can take away, no, no external factors can, can stop you from doing, you can just redirect it. Like I'm not trained, I'm not a member of a dojo right now, but I still stretch at home. And I, mm -hmm. and for me, it's all connected, you know? You, you need that internal, I think it's very valuable to have that internal motivation that you apply by going to the gym or you go to the, to the dojo or you take a belt test or whatever, but it has to come from within, you know, at the risk of sounding cliche. Well, I'm, and that's, that's, it's cliche I'm for very, a reason. Fair, fair. And I, I'm very grateful for having had those experiences and opportunities that, that allow me to, to, to keep keep growing, you know. Right on. Well, I'm glad that you you've been willing to come on and share it. Now, you also have a book that yeah goes into so, some of this. Yeah. So part of uh, so I wrote a book about my ten years with NASA. Okay. And um, I really had no. I don't. I'd self publish. Uh, I wrote it because. I want to share what I've learned. I had a very unusual career starting as a space lawyer and doing a bunch of stuff we haven't even talked about. But I have a, it's called um, How Things Work at NASA mm -hmm. and uh, How Things Work at NASA, Everyday Secrets of Space Exploration. And I'll send you the link later. Please. But um, try to tell the story of this large institution uh, that really has been at central to to world history in a lot of ways that people don't realize for the last 60 years and and this is this you know is a very important part of my life and and um actually there's a there, there's a there's a there's a great connection here like i spent 10 years working for nasa literally exploring the universe um and uh covid hit and and Around the time COVID hit, what I realized was I had spent 10 years uh, searching the universe and I found myself. Mm -hmm. And now I, I, am, uh, I work from home. My wife and her training is still working 100 hours a week. Uh, I do most of the childcare. Um, but after all those years searching the universe, like I am very, I'm content right now. And COVID, you know, everyone's had such a different response to COVID. And I'm very lucky that I haven't physically been affected by it. You know, my wife's surrounded by people with COVID for two years. Um, none of us have gotten sick. Uh, but I really did find myself after this whole journey. And um, I'm, I'm content. And it's great. Yeah. And, so, and if I, if I may, may venture yeah. some mm -hmm. of that content, contentedness, content, mm -hmm. being content. Um, yeah, is rooted in what you learned in your training. Yeah, it is. It is, and and I think having that experience of setting goals, reaching them, physical self care, it's helped in COVID actually because um, I know that to a degree I can prepare myself physically for what for what's out there. Mm. Um, keep myself healthy. And have confidence to evaluate the, you know, the world and, and, and take care of myself and my family. So where, 
you, you said the book self published. Where can people get it? They go to the website. Uh, it's on Amazon. Or? It's on okay. Amazon. You you can go to um, uh, again. And the title is How Things Work at NASA. So the the, the short version is hwan dot com. How Things Work at NASA dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, How Things Work at hwanasa dot com. How Things Work at NASA dot com. Uh, Weird. It appears to be down right now. Maybe we edit this out. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll just we'll just make sure that that the right links are are in yeah, the show notes. So just just make sure you get us what we need. Oh, yeah. And I would imagine also that if someone went to a- Amazon and just punched in most yeah. of those words in oh, roughly that order, actually, they'll get there. Actually, it's just how things work at NASA.com, All the full words. Okay. Um, how and, things work at NASA.com. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll chat it to you right here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's my story about my experience within NASA, and it's it's an unusual experience because again, I started as a regulatory compliance kind of legal person, and ended up doing a lot of program management and and um, actual research, and and I change roles all the time, and and really, I think because I had so many different transitions in my life, uh, it, it, martial arts and otherwise, that 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 really helped me with the constantly changing opportunities I had and it helped me switch kind of switch hats as I, as I had the chance to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my story. And, and uh, I hope it's, I hope it's been interesting. Absolutely. I hope it motivates people to try, uh, try new things, whether it's martial arts or not. Well, uh, of course, yeah, we'll get that link in the show notes and, and everything. And I appreciate you being here today so we're, we're going to wind down and and what final words do you have for the folks listening today um i think i would just say you know if something is if you're curious about something just go try it even if you're woefully unprepared just like you know don't don't be don't be constrained by the the, the formalities of things like i just walked into that school and said can i try it i didn't ask is there a trial class you know i said can i try it let them tell you Mm-hmm. You want to learn how to sail? Go to a go to a go to a, a, a marina and say, "We find the first person with a boat and say, will you teach me how to sail?" You know, forget the for, forget the modern formal boundaries of things. You know, all that's made up. You may have to deal with it, but it's still made up. Um, go find someone at the park doing tai chi or whatever, and say, "Can you show me?" They might say no. They might say, "Go to this school," but. You know, there, all these things are boundaries in our in the in 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 our heads. That sure they're real, and you got to deal with them. But starting without them mentally is a, is a great way to go. Whether it's martial arts or sailing or archery or whatever, you know, it's it's so it's so motivating to have something inside yourself that you can that that can survive any of the changes that life going to throw at you. At least that's what I've learned. Jeff, I want to thank you for coming on. What a fun story. The idea to me that it was so important to him to earn it, that's what stuck with me the most in this episode. It was so important that he deserve what he had. And that's not a sentiment that we often see. And when we do see it, it seems to come in hindsight. So the foresight, even at a younger age, to have that that standard is really what I'm taking away from this the most. And I think says a lot about him and his character. So Jeff, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being you. Really appreciated our time. Listeners, check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes and all the stuff that we got going there. Photos, videos, links, social media, transcripts, all kinds of good stuff. Hey, here's a tip. We've got a ton of episodes. This is the 704th episode. Have you ever thought, hey, you know what? There was an episode. I don't remember. What was it? I remember that we talked about this. I don't remember who it was or what topic title it was. There's a search function. That's a big part of why we put the transcripts up. Because if you remember part of what happened in an episode, you can go back and search for it. Guess what? I do that all the time. Now, if that or any of the other things that we do for the show and the brand... If you want to help us out with all the things that we're helping you out with, leave a review, buy a book, check out the Patreon, lots of choices. 
Are you interested in having me come to your school? I'd love to do it. I love meeting people. I love training with people. It's a great experience. Just let me know. Just reach out. We'll make it happen. Don't forget the code PODCAST15 to save 15% on whistlekick.com. If you've got guests or topic suggestions, I want to hear them. If you need to reach me, it's jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 